Siddhartha by Herman Hesse Part 1. The Brahmin's Son In the shade of the house, in the sunshine on the riverbank by the boats, in the shade of the sallow wood and the fig tree, Siddhartha, the handsome Brahmin's son, grew up with his friend Govinda. The sun browned his slender shoulders on the riverbank, while bathing at the holy ablutions, at the holy sacrifices. Shadows passed across his eyes in the mango grove during play, while his mother sang, during his father's teachings, when with the learned men. Siddhartha had already long taken part in the learned men's conversations, had engaged in debate with Govinda, and had practiced the art of contemplation and meditation with him. Already he knew how to pronounce Om silently, this word of words, to say it inwardly with the intake of breath, when breathing out with all his soul, his brow radiating the glow of pure spirit. Already he knew how to recognize Atman within the depth of his being, indestructible, at one with the universe. There was happiness in his father's heart because of his son who was intelligent and thirsty for knowledge. He saw him growing up to be a great learned man, a priest, a prince among Brahmins. There was pride in his mother's breast when she saw him walking, sitting down and rising. Siddhartha, strong, handsome, supple-limbed, greeted her with complete grace. Love stirred in the hearts of the young Brahmin's daughters when Siddhartha walked through the streets of the town with his lofty brow, his king-like eyes, and his slim figure. Govinda, his friend, the Brahmin's son, loved him more than anybody else. He loved Siddhartha's eyes and clear voice. He loved the way he walked, his complete grace of movement. He loved everything that Siddhartha did and said, and above all, he loved his intellect, his fine ardent thoughts, his strong will, his high vocation. Govinda knew that he would not become an ordinary Brahmin, a lazy sacrificial official, an avaricious dealer in magic sayings, a conceited worthless orator, a wicked sly priest, or just a good stupid sheep among a large herd. No, and he, Govinda, did not want to become any of these, not a Brahmin like ten thousand others of their kind. He wanted to follow Siddhartha, the Beloved, the Magnificent, and if he ever became a god, if he ever entered the All-Radiant, then Govinda wanted to follow him as his friend, his companion, his servant, his lance-bearer, his shadow. That was how everybody loved Siddhartha. He delighted and made everybody happy. But Siddhartha himself was not happy. Wandering along the rosy paths of the fig garden, sitting in contemplation in the bluish shade of the grove, washing his limbs in the daily bath of atonement, offering sacrifices in the depths of the shady mango wood with complete grace of manner, beloved by all, a joy to all, there was yet no joy in his own heart. Dreams and restless thoughts came flowing to him from the river, from the twinkling stars at night, from the sun's melting rays. Dreams and a restlessness of the soul came to him, arising from the smoke of the sacrifices, emanating from the verses of the Rig Veda, trickling through from the teachings of the old Brahmins. Siddhartha had begun to feel the seeds of discontent within him. He had begun to feel that the love of his father and mother, and also the love of his friend Govinda, would not always make him happy, give him peace, satisfy and suffice him. He had begun to suspect that his worthy father and his other teachers, the wise Brahmins, had already passed on to him the bulk and best of their wisdom, that they had already poured the sum total of their knowledge into his waiting vessel. And the vessel was not full, his intellect was not satisfied, his soul was not at peace, his heart was not still. The ablutions were good, but they were water, they did not wash sins away, they did not relieve the distressed heart. The sacrifices and the supplication of the gods were excellent, but were they everything? Did the sacrifices give happiness? And what about the gods? Was it really Prajapati who had created the world? Was it not Atman, he alone, who had created it? Were not the gods forms created like me and you, mortal, transient? Was it therefore good and right? Was it a sensible and worthy act to offer sacrifices to the gods? To whom else should one offer sacrifices? To whom else should one pay honour but to him, Atman, the only one? And where was Atman to be found? Where did he dwell? Where did his eternal heart beat, if not within the self, in the innermost, in the eternal which each person carried with him? 
And where was this self, this innermost? It was not flesh and bone. It was not thought or consciousness. That was what the wise men taught. Where, then, was it? She pressed towards the self, towards Atman. Was there another way that was worth seeking? Nobody showed the way. Nobody knew it. Neither his father, nor the teachers and wise men, nor the holy songs. The Brahmins and their holy books knew everything. Everything. They had gone into everything. The creation of the world, the origin of speech, food, inhalation, exhalation, the arrangement of the senses, the acts of the gods. They knew a tremendous number of things, but was it worthwhile knowing all these things if they did not know the one important thing, the only important thing? Many verses of the holy books, above all the Upanishads and Samaveda, spoke of this innermost thing. It is written, Your soul is the whole world. It says that when a man is asleep, he penetrates his innermost and dwells in Atman. There was wonderful wisdom in these verses. All the knowledge of the sages was told there in enchanting language, pure as honey collected by the bees. No, this tremendous amount of knowledge, collected and preserved by successive generations of wise Brahmins, could not be easily overlooked. But where were the Brahmins, the priests, the wise men, who were successful not only in having this most profound knowledge, but in experiencing it? Where were the initiated, who, attaining Atman in sleep, could retain it in consciousness, in life, everywhere, in speech and in action. Siddhartha knew many worthy Brahmins, above all his father, holy, learned, of highest esteem. His father was worthy of admiration. His manner was quiet and noble. He lived a good life, his words were wise. Fine and noble thoughts dwelt in his head. But even he who knew so much, did he live in bliss? Was he at peace? Was he not also a seeker? insatiable? Did he not go continually to the holy springs with an insatiable thirst, to the sacrifices, to books, to the Brahmin's discourses? Why must he, the blameless one, wash away his sins and endeavour to cleanse himself anew each day? Was Atman then not within him? Was not then the source within his own heart? One must find the source within one's own self, one must possess it. Everything else was seeking, a detour, error, these were Siddhartha's thoughts. This was his thirst, his sorrow. He often repeated to himself the words from one of the Chandogya Upanishads. In truth, the name of the Brahman is Satyam. Indeed, he who knows it enters the heavenly world each day. It often seemed near the heavenly world, but never had he quite reached it, never had he quenched the final thirst. And among the wise men that he knew, and whose teachings he enjoyed, there was not one who had entirely reached it, the heavenly world, not one who had completely quenched the eternal first. Govinda, said Siddhartha to his friend, Govinda, come with me to the Banyana tree, we will practice meditation. They went to the Banyana tree and sat down, twenty paces apart. As he sat down ready to pronounce the Om, Siddhartha softly recited the verse, Om is the bow, the arrow is the soul. Brahman is the arrow's goal, at which one aims unflinchingly. When the customary time for the practice of meditation had passed, Govinda rose. It was now evening. It was time to perform the evening ablutions. He called Siddhartha by his name. He did not reply. Siddhartha sat absorbed, his eyes staring as if directed at a distant goal, the tip of his tongue showing a little between his teeth. He did not seem to be breathing. He sat thus, lost in meditation, thinking Om, his soul as the arrow directed at Brahman. Some Samanas once passed through Siddhartha's town, wandering ascetics. They were three thin, worn-out men, neither old nor young, with dusty and bleeding shoulders, practically naked, scorched by the sun, solitary, strange and hostile, lean jackals in the world of men. Around them hovered an atmosphere of still passion, of devastating service, of unpitying self-denial. In the evening, after the hour of contemplation, Siddhartha said to Govinda, Tomorrow morning, my friend, Siddhartha is going to join the Samanas. He is going to become a Samana. Govinda blanched as he heard these words and read the decision in his friend's determined face, 
undeviating as the released arrow from the bow. Govinda realised from the first glance at his friend's face that now it was beginning. Siddhartha was going his own way, his destiny was beginning to unfold itself, and with his destiny, his own, and he became as pale as a dried banana skin. Oh, Siddhartha, he cried, will your father permit it? Siddhartha looked at him like one who had just awakened. As quick as lightning, he read Govinda's soul, read the anxiety, the resignation. We will not waste words, Govinda, he said softly. Tomorrow at daybreak, I will begin the life of the Samanas. Let us not discuss it again. Siddhartha went into the room where his father was sitting on a mat made of bast. He went up behind his father and remained standing there until his father felt his presence. Is it you, Siddhartha? the Brahmin asked. Then speak what is in your mind. Siddhartha said, With your permission, father, I have come to tell you that I wish to leave your house tomorrow and join the ascetics. I wish to become a Samana. I trust my father will not object. The Brahmin was silent so long that the stars passed across the small window and changed their design before the silence in the room was finally broken. His son stood silent and motionless with his arms folded. The father, silent and motionless, sat on the mat and the stars passed across the sky. Then his father said, It is not seemly for Brahmins to utter forceful and angry words, but there is displeasure in my heart. I should not like to hear you make this request a second time. The Brahmin rose slowly. Siddhartha remained silent with folded arms. Why are you waiting? asked his father. You know why, answered Siddhartha. His father left the room displeased and lay down on his bed. As an hour passed by and he could not sleep, the Brahmin rose, wandered up and down, and then left the house. He looked through the small window of the room and saw Siddhartha standing there with his arms folded, unmoving. He could see his pale robe shimmering. His heart troubled. The father returned to his bed. As another hour passed and the Brahmin could not sleep, he rose again, walked up and down, left the house and saw that the moon had risen. He looked through the window. Siddhartha stood there unmoving, his arms folded. The moon shone on his bare shin bones. His heart troubled. The father went to bed. He returned again after an hour and again after two hours, looked through the window and saw Siddhartha standing there in the moonlight, in the starlight, in the dark. And he came silently again, hour after hour, looked into the room and saw him standing unmoving, his heart filled with anger with anxiety, with fear, with sorrow. And in the last hour of the night, before daybreak, he returned again, entered the room and saw the youth standing there. He seemed tall and a stranger to him. Siddhartha, he said, why are you waiting? You know why. Will you go on standing and waiting until it is day, noon, evening? I will stand and wait. You will grow tired, Siddhartha. I will grow tired. You will fall asleep, Siddhartha. I will not fall asleep. You will die, Siddhartha. I will die. And would you rather die than obey your father? Siddhartha has always obeyed his father. So you will give up your project? Siddhartha will do what his father tells him. The first light of day entered the room. The Brahmin saw that Siddhartha's knees trembled slightly, but there was no trembling in Siddhartha's face. His eyes looked far away. Then, the father realised that Siddhartha could no longer remain with him at home, that he had already left him. The father touched Siddhartha's shoulder. You will go into the forest, he said, and become a Samana. If you find bliss in the forest, come back and teach it to me. If you find disillusionment, come back, and we shall again offer sacrifices to the gods together. Now go, kiss your mother and tell her where you are going. For me, however, it is time to go to the river and perform the first ablution. He dropped his hand from his son's shoulder and went out. Siddhartha swayed as he tried to walk. He controlled himself, bowed to his father, and went to his mother to do what had been told of him. As, with benumbed legs, he slowly left the still-sleeping town at daybreak, a crouching shadow emerged from the last hut and joined the pilgrim. It was Govinda.
You have come, said Siddhartha, and smiled. I have come, said Govinda. Govinda. 